Previously, I'm embarking on a fairly ambitious new project. I want to make something amazing, something that you'd be able to base a career on. But I'll need your help. I'm only just getting started. Could take six months to a year of development time, but it will be special and it will be community based. And it's going to be great. Hi. We're going to be getting into a bit of software engineering today. Don't worry, I'll go easy on you. But before we get started, I just want to give you an idea of what to expect from this blog from here on out. See, up to now we've been pretty much looking at the features that Loopy Masterpiece is going to have and what the interface is going to look like and how it's going to work. From now on it's going to get a little bit more technical, hopefully not too much, but I'm going to start developing here and I want this blog to be a chronicle of the development of an app from start to finish. I, what I want to do is give you an idea of what goes into an app like this, you know, what your, what your money buys. So we're going to be talking today about uh, architecting the app and in future weeks we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that and eventually we'll be getting into the coding. I'm not going to be doing a programming tutorial or anything like that, so don't panic, but I want to just give you just a, a very light overview of what goes into this and how various bits work together and I think it'll be fun. So let's dive in. Now I don't want this to turn into a software engineering tutorial, but there's one thing I want to tell you about before we get started. You may or may not have heard of the model view controller paradigm, but it's at the center of iOS and Mac development, and I want to tell you about it. So it's a way of breaking up a piece of software into manageable categories, and it makes development easier. So model objects are the brains of a piece of software. They control the logic and they do things like make calculations and interact with databases or files, communicate over the network, that sort of thing. In Loopy, there's a model for track and clock and session, for example. Next, there are view objects. Those are the things that the user sees and interacts with. They're buttons and lists and special controls that are particular to the app, like Loopy's track view. Often they'll represent the state of a model object in some way too, like the way that the waveform on the track view shows what audio is in the track. Finally, there are controller objects, which are the masterminds of the whole thing. They create and coordinate both models and views. They kind of sit between the two and they manage top level functions like, say, setting up and displaying dialogues or opening and closing documents, that sort of thing. So right now I'm designing the model objects for Masterpiece. Those are the building blocks and it's really important to get it as correct as possible, as early as possible. Sometimes in a simpler app, those are obvious and you can dive straight in and start coding, but with an app like Masterpiece, it really needs some serious thought well ahead of writing any code. I'm going to walk you through the design of Loopy's action system because I think it's a useful demonstration of why it's a good idea to flesh out as much of an app's functionality as early as possible. That's the stuff that we did over the last few weeks. So you'll remember some of the features we talked about. We want to be able to trigger actions via MIDI commands and we want to be able to perform more than one action at a time. We want to do the same thing with controls on the workspace as well, that's the gadgets or the widgets or whatever we're going to call them. We also want to record sessions in multi-track format with editable timings and automations. That's the arrange view I talked about in the first couple of posts. And we want to be able to edit tracks and have per track automations which play back with the track. And finally, we talked about sequence tracks last week where we can program a particular kind of track to perform a set of actions with, with our own timings. Oh, and I'm, I'm keen to have as much of the app controllable as possible, of course. So after some thought, it became clear that those five features, that's MIDI, widgets, session automation recording, per track automations, and sequence tracks, they all have one thing in common. They're all invoking actions. So that's a good place to start. Let's have a model that represents an action. It should be able to be uniquely identified so it can be you know, saved in preferences and presets and in the session and it can be recalled later. It needs to be able to be invoked so it'll need some code to run when it's triggered. And it'll have some parameters that can be controlled that's specific to the action, like uh, how long to fade out for or which track to select for a select action. For automations, that's an action that will set a value like uh, volume or pan or the parameter of an effect. So there'll need to be some kind of action that can do that, both for continuous values like volume and for discrete values like a switch, you know, on and off, like a effect bypass. With that, 
we can tie an action to say a MIDI event or a control in the workspace and you can pile up multiple actions by keeping a list of them. You just move through the list. Now if the majority of the app's functions should be controllable like that, well, we really need a way to create a list of those actions. A track's going to have a bunch of actions you can perform on it as will say the clock or the master volume control or an effect. So we need to create a way for those things to tell us what actions can be performed on them. To do that, we define a protocol. That's a set of behaviors that we define that any object can adopt. Let's call it, say, actionable. It'll give us a way to know what actions can be performed on something. And if we group the actions into categories, we won't have to worry about a massive list that's really hard to navigate. By the way, we don't want to see each instance of an actionable object creating its own actions, or we'd have 20 different play actions for a track if you have 20 tracks. So that means the action querying stuff really has got to be per class, you know, per type, not per instance, so that we only get one set per type. For the same reason, we also need to distinguish between the template of an action and an instance of an action that we're actually going to perform. So we can split them into two models, say, action and performed action. Now we just need a way to query those objects, so we make an action dictionary. Uh, now let's call it an action directory, which will gather actionable types and give us a way to query them all. Sorted. So now we need a way of scheduling those actions so that rather than happening straight away all at once, they happen at a time we set. If we give performed action a timestamp at which it should be performed, we'll be able to schedule it as part of a sequence. Let's call it sequence and we can let it take a list of performed actions. So that lets us perform discrete events, but what about automation curves? That's still a sequence, but it's a bit specialized because it's going to need to smoothly change values between the control points. So let's split up sequence into two subclasses, say action sequence, which is what we had already, and automation sequence. Now, that's gonna differ because rather than having a list of actions to perform, it's going to have just one action per sequence, that's a value action, like control volume, and the value that it'll be invoked with will change over time, dictated by the control points. Oh, let's make a class for that too, call it control point, and put it into a list for the automation sequence. When the time comes to write the code, we'll use those control points to figure out the values for a particular time. Now, that gives us the tools we need to set up action sequences for all five of the features I mentioned at the start. So we've got MIDI, widgets, session automation recording, per track automations, and sequence tracks. Now all we need is a way to actually act on that information. We need a scheduler. That'll take a bunch of sequences and execute their actions at the right time. So the scheduler is time-based. That's gonna need a way to know when to perform those actions. There are a number of, a number of ways that could be done, but because this is a music app, we, want, we really want accurate timing, ideally at the sample level. So what we can do is every time the audio system asks us for some audio, we check the current time against the schedules and perform actions when their time arrives. That means we'll be polling regularly, so we need a time base to check against. Let's call that a clock. It'll remember what time it was started at, and we can get the current time in the timeline by figuring out the difference between that starting time and the time right now. So the scheduler gets access to the clock, and it manages a list of sequences that we can add to and remove from if we're going to cancel something. And with each tick of the audio system, it'll get the time from the clock, and it'll check it against all of the actions in the sequences. When any of the actions time comes, that action gets performed. So if you've got a sequence track, when you start playing, it adds its sequence to the scheduler, which starts churning through those actions. When you stop it, it removes its sequence. And the same goes for tracks. So when they're played, any automations that are part of the track's timeline are scheduled. And the same goes for playing back recordings on the arrange screen. The whole arrangement will be given to the schedule and it'll just go through and play the lot like an old uh, pianola or something. Triggering MIDI actions or interacting with controls in the workspace, that will probably just invoke those actions directly. But if we wanted to, those could activate schedules too. And finally, this is a, <laughs> this is a nice little freebie. When you tap a track with Quantize enabled, it's going to cause a new sequence to be scheduled, which contains a play or a record action at a time that corresponds to the next bar 
or whatever quantize is set to, and maybe an end record action for the bar after that. So we kind of get that for free. Now, there's only one thing left to do, and that's recording those actions as they happen when we're actually, you know, recording a session. Fortunately, that one's easy. When an action happens, the object responsible, the, the actionable, so a track, for example, is going to announce that it happened. It'll create a new performed action, it'll set its properties, and it'll call announce on it. And that's going to send up a flare. For example, a track could say, I started playing. And it'll have the action, which will be play, and a timestamp that corresponds to when it happened. Now we'll record those with a sequence recorder. And when the recording's done, we'll store that sequence along with the recording. So I think that should deal with pretty much everything that we've talked about in the last weeks, at least as far as track actions go. See, that's why it's a really good idea to be doing this design stuff now. Uh, if, for example, the sequence track uh, idea came a few months later on down the line, once I'd already had a design, it would be much harder to actually make that change. You see, any changes that come later in a project's timeline are much, much harder to incorporate than stuff figured out right at the start. Because that's when you are figuring out how everything's going to fit together. And squeezing things in later often doesn't work very well. And that's why we're here now, because it's I wanted to get you in so that we could play with these ideas right at the beginning. Okay, that's all from me. If you've stuck with it so far, well done. Uh, tune in next week for more development stuff. See ya.